Hello friends, we are back with the fifth module of our MOOCs course where we are discussing about the reactor thermal hydraulics and today in this second lecture we are trying to wrap up this particular chapter. As was discussed in the previous module or rather previous lecture, the term thermal hydraulics relates to the fluid flow and heat transfer behavior and hence in this particular module we are focusing on the heat transfer aspects inside the reactor. That is the amount of energy which has been released because of fission reaction, how that can get transferred to the uh, coolant which is flowing al around the fuel rods or fuel elements that we are discussing here and uh, what are the corresponding temperature profiles that is really a primary importance or primary interest in this particular chapter. So, if we quickly revisit what we have done in the previous lecture, we, uh, we discussed about the homogeneous and heterogeneous nuclear reactor. In a homogeneous nuclear reactor, we have an uniform distribution of fuel and moderator. Uh, basically, most of the homogeneous nuclear reactors are of uh, aqua solution type where some nuclear so aqua, aqua solution of a nuclear salt like uranium sulphate or uranium nitrate is uh, present and uh, if we take a sample from anywhere in the reactor we are going to get the same kind of chemical composition. How, while homogeneous nuclear reactor has several advantages, but uh, there are quite a few disadvantages also particularly from kinetics and control point of view and that is why the use of uh, homogeneous reactors particularly the aqueous homogeneous reactors are restricted to small scale applications such as a medical isotope separation or hydrogen production by radiolysis. And for power generation purpose, we uh, almost universally use heterogeneous reactors where fuels and moderators are placed as uh, discrete elements generally following some kind of regularized pattern. We have also discussed about different properties of fuel and cladding and uh, now we know what are the desirable properties that we need to have for a fuel like high thermal conductivity. Uh, corrosion resistance characteristics, uh, good mechanical strength at elevated temperature. Cladding has a big role to play in the last point that is uh, cladding is some kind of jacket which covers the fuel thereby providing its structural solidity and the cladding material should also have very low absorption cross section and high thermal conductivity. Sometimes it can also provide uh, some additional uh, or extended heat transfer surfaces particularly when we are using some kind of gas as a coolant. Then we go into the general energy consideration and uh, there we have seen that while uh, generally more than 200 MeV of energy is produced for every fission reaction, uh, we can get only about 75 to 80 percent of that transferred to the coolant while remaining goes in the form of radiation primarily. Uh, the volumetric energy generation can be related by relation like this where uh, your prime is actually that effective energy that is available from a reaction and phi represents the neutron uh, distribution inside the reactor. Uh, actually, uh, uh, this is of course, at a particular location this integration is done. So, in a way you can also say this volumetric generation that we are writing this is actually a function of R. And then uh, we discussed a specific case for a cylindrical reactor which contains a large number of uh, fuel cylindrical fuel rods. Capital R is the radius of that reactor and capital H is the height of that cylinder and accordingly we got this particular solution for this heat generation and it is function seen to be a function of both R which is the radial direction coordinate and Z which is the axial direction coordinate. And finally, we have done the heat transfer analysis for two simplified geometries. Uh, commonly in nuclear reactors fuels are present either in the form of rectangular plates, very thin rectangular plates and also cylindrical fuel rods. Those rods generally are such small diameter they are often referred as fuel pins. So, we have done uh, quite simplified heat transfer analysis for both the cases by assuming constant fuel fluid sorry constant properties for both fuel and cladding and also a very important assumption by assuming uniform rate of heat generation throughout the reactor. And this was the solution that we have obtained for a plate type reactor where uh, we can we have calculated this uh, temperature difference that we may have across the fuel and also the temperature difference we may have across the cladding. This uh, gap situation we have not analyzed, but practical reactors may have a gap also an air gap between the fuel and the cladding. And also we have derived expression for this flame temperature difference which is actually the temperature difference across the coolant boundary layer on the surface of the cladding. And um, we have also got by assuming some temperature value for the fuel center line, we have got expressions for the temperature at the fuel cladding interface 
at the cladding outer surface and also for the bulk of the fluid. And uh, we have seen that primarily if we neglect the gap between the fuel and cladding, we can draw a simple electrical analogy for that situation where T naught is the fuel center line temperature uh, which can be thought about as a source of energy and T bulk is the bulk fluid temperature and in between uh, there are three resistances through which the heat flux or rate of heat transfer whatever we would like to consider that is flowing through. Here Q dot is the rate of heat transfer and R 1, R 2 and R 3 are the three resistances. R 1 is the fuel thermal resistance, R 2 corresponds to the cladding thermal resistance. Both R 1 and R 2 are actually conductive resistance because fuel and cladding generally being uh, solid in nature. Uh, liquid fuel can of course be there as we have discussed in the last lecture, but liquid fuel is primarily used in homogeneous reactors whereas heterogeneous reactors primarily use solid fuels only. So, both fuel and cladding are solid materials and hence R 1 and R 2 both refer to conduction resistances only. R 3 rather refers to the convective resistance because of the convective heat transfer that is going from the uh, going between the coolant outer surface and the bulk of the fluid. These are the two geometries that we have considered the plate type fuel and the cylindrical fuel rod and these are the expressions that we got for the fuel resistance. We just derive these expressions without discussing into the details. We can clearly see that the resistance for both the cases are inversely proportional to the thermal conductivity of the fuel which is a very logical uh, very which is very logical observation. Higher the thermal conductivity means the smaller will be the value of this resistance and therefore, the smaller will be the temperature difference across the fuel or the temperature difference between T dot and T s which is the surface temperature at the fuel cladding interface. The difference between T naught and T s will uh, progressively be smaller as the thermal conductivity of fuel keeps on increasing. That is why metallic fuels are highly preferable so that we can keep the temperature differential small but metallic fuel pure metallic fuels or metallic alloys have their own disadvantages like uh, lower melting points etc. If we use uh, some oxide fuel or ceramic fuel thermal conductivity will be quite low and we may have significant amount of temperature change across the fuel. Then the second group of resistance which is associated with the conduction through the cladding that is also quite uh, proper inversely proportional to the thermal conductivity of the cladding. Now, cladding generally uses some kind of metallic ele element like mag metallic alloys like magnox or zircal alloy or maybe stainless steel which have quite reasonable values of the thermal conductivity and hence the temperature change across the cladding itself is uh, generally very small. And finally, we have the conduction sorry the convection resistance for the associated with the heat transfer from the cladding outer surface to the bulk of the fluid and this uh, as expected is inversely proportional to the conv corresponding convective heat transfer coefficient. So, for any of the elements we can always write that the rate of heat transfer is equal to the effective temperature difference which is T naught minus T bulk divided by the corresponding resistance uh, and the if we consider the case for a fuel rod then the total resistance has to be equal to delta T by Q dot is the summation of these three components. Mm, the first one refers to the conductive resistance to the fuel, second one is the same for the cladding and third is of course the convective resistance, convective flame resistance I should say. So, we can take 2 pi h outside the bracket and we get a simplified form. For most of the practical reactors however, the thickness of the cladding is extremely small compared to the diameter of the fuel itself or radius of the fuel itself. Fuel pins are also having quite small diameter, but uh, size of the cladding can be even uh, significantly smaller than that. So, whenever we are uh, dealing with a situation where B is extremely small compared to A, we can perform a simple analysis. We know that log of 1 plus x uh, can be expanded as if uh, x is sufficiently small we can always write this as x minus x square by 2 plus x cube by 3 minus dots. So, in this case also when b becomes uh, smaller than a we can write log 1 plus b y upon a to be nearly equal to b upon a here we are neglecting all the terms from second order onwards and uh, accordingly this equation simplifies to even simpler form like this. Now, this total resistance is quite important uh, knowledge to have. 
because uh, of course uh, if you have done this analysis using a very simplified uh, form of the heat generation we have assumed a uniform heat generation throughout the entire uh, fuel pin or fuel plate element however that is not true in practice there is always uh, variation in the heat flux in both radial and axial direction for a fuel rod but generally the dimension in the radial direction is so small compared to that in the axial direction we can invariably take the temperature variation in the radial direction to be negligible and consider only the axial directional variation and in that case this concept of thermal resistance is very important we shall be seeing that in this particular case here our geometry is that of a cylindrical uh, reactor um, here uh, actually the diagram is uh, not perfectly placed you can say this is a fuel pin that I have shown here a fuel pin which is uh, having this r is wrong which is having a radius of a and the corresponding thickness of the cladding is b and here now instead of one we are taking two dimensions r is the radial direction and z is the axial direction and our center or the origin of the coordinate system is located at the centroid of this particular fuel pin that is uh, we can say that the expanse of the fuel pin in the radial direction is from r equal to 0 to r equal to a whereas that in the axial direction is from some minus h by 2 to plus h by 2 as h is the total height and this particular location or uh, sorry let me correct this this particular location refers to z equal to 0 and now this is the fuel pin that we have and we are placing this fuel pin inside a large cylindrical reactor of radius capital R and height as the same height of the uh, of each fuel element which is capital H. Now we have earlier analyzed such a situation and seen that the in the last lecture we have seen that corresponding distribution of the volumetric heat flux can have a form like this. Now if we apply this equation to a fuel rod which is located just at the center of the coordinate system just like this one here that means it is located at a position at r equal to 0 and so uh, invariably we can reduce this one to a form like this that means the heat flux becomes a sole function of z but uh, this is applicable only for the fuel rods which are located quite close to the origin that is at r equal to 0. If we are talking about a location which is, uh, ha which is uh, not very close to the center line then Q then in that case we can also write Q dot triple prime is equal to Q dot triple prime max which is a function of R into this cos pi z by h where this uh, Q dot max will keep on varying in the radial direction and for different radial location we are going to get different value for this maxima. But uh, presently let us restrict ourselves to a fuel rod located close to the center line very close to the center line so that the R dependence can be neglected and hence for that particular fuel element this uh, heat generation becomes a sole function of the axial directional coordinate which spans from minus h by 2 to plus h by 2. Now in a practical reactor quite often you will find that the fuels are having an arrangement like this they are generally placed in a lattice like this where they, uh, these are uh, several, these circles are all fuel rods like 9 circles are shown here each of them uh, is uh, each of them is a fuel rod and all of them are immersed into the uh, large expansion of coolant. Uh, so, so there is no exclusive coolant channel and the coolant is only flowing through the intermediate spaces between this fuel pin. Now we, instead of considering all this coolant channel or all this fuel and coolant flow around that let us just consider one and use the corresponding symmetric condition with respect to the other. So here each fuel rod is having, an, having a radius of A and around each of them we have considered a square of size S. Here S is the spacing between two uh, neighboring coolant fuel rod in both directions. So and S is also the size or dimension of this particular square block that we have selected. So we can be visualized to have a form like this where uh, we have our domain reduces to a square block 
which is uh, being filled up with water and that uh, or whatever coolant we are may be using and also there uh, at the say around the centroid of that we are having a circular fuel pin which is having a radius of a this is the view from the other direction here let us consider an infinitesimally small portion of this particular fuel rod and surrounding coolant which is having a height of dz. So, if we apply an energy balance whatever amount of energy that has been produced by this particular fuel element over which is having let us say the fuel element is having cross section area of f and its height is dz. So, over this volume of a f into dz whatever amount of energy the fuel uh, releases the entire amount of energy can be visualized to be consumed by the uh, fluid which is restricted within this area a c accordingly we may write this particular energy balance equation where d q dot is the amount of energy released by the fuel element over the small portion of d z and this is the corresponding temperature rise of this fluid m dot c is the corresponding mass flow rate and d t b is the temperature difference of the the temperature difference the fluid experiences while passing through this um, L, passing through this infinitesimal small time of dz. Now, d q dot can be visualized as the instead of writing power we can consider this one to be the volumetric power multiplied by the total area of the heat transfer surface. So, here the heat transfer is taking place from the fuel towards the surrounding coolant and in this case the effective area has to be the fuel surface area which is a f and now on the right hand side we can expand this uh, mass flow rate as the product of rho in, and the corresponding cross section area of the channel in and the velocity, but uh, it is not necessary also if we reorient that using the original form then uh, the temperature difference of the fluid across the channel comes out to be in this particular form and uh, then if we put now the expression for the heat flux. Uh, which is of course, a as we have neglected any kind of radial variation. So, the only variation that remains is in the axial direction which is following cosine function and therefore, this temperature difference is also found to be a cosine function. We need to integrate uh, this function from the inlet of the channel till the end of the channel or maybe till some intermediate location. So, that we can calculate the temperature of the coolant at that particular location. So, this is how we are performing the integration from uh, some minus h by 2 which refers to the inlet of the channel to z which can be some arbitrary location inside the channel and corresponding temperatures are d t b naught refers to the temperature at the location h naught or I should say minus h by 2 d t b naught refers to the this refers to the temperature of the coolant at this particular location which can be visualized as the inlet to the channel. So, after performing this integration this is the expression that we are going to get where uh, we are having T B naught the inlet, inlet temperature for the coolant and then some constant terms and finally, a sinusoidal component. Here the total temperature rise of the coolant can be obtained by putting minus h by 2 in the above equation and uh, hence that again uh, brings some sort of this again uh, it is some sort of constant as you can see if we do not consider the very radial variation in the maximum heat flux other terms all are constant and here this numerator can also be replaced with the term v rod where v rod refers to the volume of each fuel rod. Now, how it can be the volume of each fuel rod that should be the cross section area of the fuel rod into h and its cross section area is pi a square into h. So, the the term a square h in this equation can be replaced by the volume of the rod you had by pi which exactly we have done here. This is the uh, total change in the coolant temperature during its passage from the passage to the reactor and if we use this expression for this total temperature rise then the temperature profile for the coolant can also be written in a form like this. And also the term beta that we are using as an abbreviation that is nothing but pi by h. So, for a cylindrical fuel element now 
we know that the temperature difference across the coolant flame that is temperature at the cladding surface minus the bulk flow temperature is something like this. Now, if we use the concept of the this is the concept of the thermal resistance. So, if we put the expression for T c or rather T bulk into this which we have just obtained the previous slide here this then we can get uh, this particular expression which here which can be simplified by putting the expression for actually not simplified we can expand this the q dot the rate of heat transfer that is there that has been replaced by corresponding cosine term and finally we arrive at this that is the variation of coolant temperature in the axial direction can directly be related to the coolant inlet temperature and the uh, the sin and cosine term with beta in as one of the coefficients or uh, beta in embedded in the bracket. Here this theta c is actually a shorthand form that we are writing which is equal to a square into q triple prime dot max divided by uh, twice a plus b into h which uh, we have used only to keep this equation slightly shorter. Similarly, we can also calculate the temperature at the interface between the fuel and cladding and also you can calculate the fuel center line temperature that is exactly that has been attempted to this is the center line temperature here T s z refers to the temperature of the interface between fuel and cladding and we get a much bigger expression for this like uh, here we have uh, two different resistances coming in this one corresponds to the flame resistance and this one corresponds to the cladding resistance. And finally, if we write the expression for T naught z which is actually the temperature at the uh, center line of the solid then we get the same form, but now we have three regulatory resistances Well, this one corresponds to the cladding this one corresponds to the conductive resistance for the fuel. And this is the typical temperature variation that we may find for a cylindrical reactor generally. While this one is for the coolant, this is uh, this is the inlet of the channel, this is the exit of the channel, and this is the center line in the axial direction. So as we move towards the exit, the uh, coolant is getting more and more uh, energy, increased amount of energy because of the fission energy release, and uh, hence the coolant temperature continues to increase unless of course it reaches some prescribed value. However, that is not true for the other two temperatures of interest one is the center fuel center line temperature and other is the cladding surface temperature. This T m refers to actually fuel center line temperature as per our terminology. You can see both the cases both or both the profiles show a maxima. So, the location of this maxima for the cladding surface temperature can be found by setting that uh, ddz of cladding temperature to be equal to 0 which uh, reduces to a form like this and uh, after performing the differentiation we are having this and finally, we get the location of this optimum lo optimum cladding surface temperature. Similarly, you can also calculate the location of the optimum uh, fuels center line temperature you know, that is by setting d t f d z equal to 0 and corresponding form is this and we get z center line optimum value of the center line equal to 1 by beta into tan inverse delta T b by 2 theta bar c. Here a theta bar actually is a shorthand notation because as there are quite a few terms involved three different resistances involved and during the calculation for the fuel we uh, consider them in a short notation of actually there is a typing error here. here this is this theta c bar that I refer to and this should be theta c that we are using from from the earlier slide onwards. So, this way we can calculate the optima for uh, both the profiles if we want we can also calculate the optimum location for the temperature where the temperature is maximum at the fuel cladding interface, but generally that is not of a great interest or uh, major interest is to know where the fuel center line temperature is maximum that we can obtain here. And by putting these expressions for z optima in the corresponding temperature expressions, we can also get the value of this maximum temperatures like the maximum cladding surface temperature or maximum fuel center line temperature or maximum temperature value at the interface of the fuel and cladding. 
but uh, those generally are quite big expressions that is why they have been avoided here. Next we need to know about the heat transfer coefficient. We know that uh, the generally there are three resistances that we have seen. One important thing is that uh, the analysis that we have just done while the concept of fuel thermal the thermal resistances were uh, developed following an uniform heat transfer distribution or uniform value of the heat generation throughout the reactor. But when we are having uh, some kind of distribution for the heat generation in the radial and axial direction both we can still use the concept of those resistances. And uh, two of them being conductive resistances they are very standard because the thermal con once we have selected the material we know its thermal conductivity and corresponding resistance values uh, as once we fix up the dimensions as well corresponding resistance values are fixed. But the convective resistance depends on the heat transfer coefficient and the heat transfer coefficient may depends on infinite number of factors like it may depend on what is the nature of the coolant, what is the nature of the cladding outer surface that is a surface where the solid and fluid are having some kind of interaction, what is the nature of the flow itself whether it is laminar or turbulent and uh, similarly several other factors. But commonly for any general uh, coolant like water or heavy water or organic liquids or gaseous heat transfer coefficient can have a form like this. A uh, Nusselt number can always be expressed as a function of Reynolds and Prandtl numbers. Here Reynolds number is defined uh, as form like this. You can see uh, here u is the velocity of the coolant and nu is the kinematic viscosity of that chosen generally corresponding to the average temperatures. And uh, other term that we can find in the definition of both Reynolds number and Nusselt number is d equivalent which actually is a suitable length scale and it is also called the equivalent diameter. D equivalent it is or hydraulic diameter also is a much a very common name. Now equivalent diameter has a definition of 4 AC by pi where AC is the corresponding cross section area and pi is the weighted perimeter. Now, if we are dealing with a channel with circular cross section say your geometry is that of a circular channel and through which the coolant is flowing then calculation of this d equivalent is very easy. In this case if uh, d is the diameter of this one then d equivalent is 4 into the area of this one area should be pi d square by 4 and divided by what should be the weighted perimeter for this? This is pi into d, so it comes equal to d. That is when you are having dealing with a circular channel, this is just uh, reducing to the diameter of the channel. But when you are dealing with a non-circular duct channel, then we have to uh, find a way of calculating this d equilibrium. Like this one is the common uh, representation of uh, fuel and fuel rods and coolants inside the reactor, where we are having circular fuel rods each of uh, radius a and we can select a square of size s around each of this here s is the spacing between successive fuel rods. So, this uh, this particular portion this hash portion can be viewed to be uh, occupied by the coolant so, like we have done we have considered earlier in our early analysis. In this particular case we can calculate equilibrium dimension to be something like this. Here what is the area for each such don't s square is the area of the square and uh, the area occupied by the coolant will be this minus the area of corresponding circular fuel rod. So, this pi s square this multiplied by the 4 and what will be the corresponding uh, weighted area that has to be the perimeter of this particular circle or circular fuel rod which is 2 pi a that is precisely what is written here. If your geometry this is the most common geometry, but if the geometry is something else we can the same way calculate corresponding equilibrium length uh, equivalent diameter or the length scale to identify Reynolds number and Nusselt number. There are several ways we can put the values of this coefficient c and these two exponents m and n. One can be the age old detach volta correlation where c is 0.023 m equal to 0.8 and this being a heating case n equal to 0.4, but there are several others experimental relations. Here we have to depend upon experimental correlations to identify the expression for Nusselt number. Uh, for ordinary flow for flow of ordinary water through a lattice of rods this is one correlation that uh, that sometimes is used in nuclear thermal hydraulics 
here you can see m equal to remains the same that is 0.8 and n equal to one third but x c is having instead of a constant number it is having some kind of expression here this uh, v w refers to the volume of water that is present inside such one element that is the square minus circle whatever is left what is the volume of that volume of water that is present there and this is v f the volume of fuel uh, the fuel rod corresponding to again such each uh, selected module. There can be several other correlations as well, uh, but which are applicable for such kind of coolants. And if we are using liquid metal as coolant, liquid metals have much higher thermal conductivity compared to the other coolants and therefore, those uh, details boulder kind of relations are not applicable. One correlation that is commonly used as proposed by Dewey, uh, particularly for hexagonal lattices is like this. Here S is the same that is the spacing between neighboring fuel rods and the D is the diameter of the fuel rod. So, D is actually twice of this A. Uh, this psi bar is uh, some kind of empirically fitted constant where we can find Prandtl number and Reynolds numbers involved and also you have Peclet number P which is the product of Reynolds and Prandtl number. So, this is one correlation that can be used when you are having liquid metal as the coolant, but this one has a restriction it is uh, applicable only for S greater than uh, 1.35 times the diameter. Yes. And if we are dealing with uh, a channel where the uh, diameter is much or this uh, S by D ratio is much smaller a much uh, tightly packed lattice this can be one of the relations that can be used. If we are using a lattice which is not hexagonal in nature some kind of a say, say a triangular lattice or a square lattice then this Nusel number relation uh, can be multiplied uh, with a suitable conversion factor and then the same formula can be used. This is a uh, typical nature of the temperature distribution that we get across the liquid flame. When you are having a non, -cool non metallic uh, coolant there you can uh, the thermal conductivity being small corresponding resistance is quite large and we can see this is a rapid, rapid reduction in the uh, coolant temperature quite close to the surface. But uh, if we are using liquid coolant or liquid metal as the coolant because of high thermal conductivity it increases quite gradually and almost following a straight line kind of relation. But this is applicable these relations are applicable when we are ha dealing with single phase coolant, but there may be several situations particularly in boiling water reactors where actually there is a phase change involved inside the reactor that is liquid coolant like liquid water enters the channel there after absorbing heat it reaches the corresponding saturation temperature and then again it can uh, start to get converted to vapor phase. So, in such kind of situation we need some knowledge of boiling heat transfer. Uh, I hope all of you have idea about this and this as this is the classical diagram available in almost every heat transfer book, but uh, just for the purpose of completion uh, the completeness of this one I am mentioning here about the boiling cup that we may get for a pool boiling situation. Pool boiling refers to where we are uh, heating up a uh, some quantity of fluid, fluid in an open container. So, that there is no exclusive flow before the initiation of heat transfer. In such kind of case we get four clear regimes uh, of heat transfer here on the horizontal uh, sorry the vertical axis the heat flux is plotted on logarithmic scale and in the horizontal axis we have delta T which is actually the uh, wall temperature minus saturation temperature corresponding to the pressure at which this experiment is being conducted. So, initially we get a pure convection zone where liquid uh, is present pure single phase liquid and phase change is yet to get started. Then we enter a nuclear boiling regime where uh, we have isolated bubble formation at the heating heated surface which after some time may get detached from the surface and then rise because of uh, the buoyancy effect. Then something not marked here this is an intermediate zone where it is difficult to say exactly what is happening and then we have a stable flame boiling zone where a flame of liquid or I should say a flame of vapor is formed on the heated surface. This intermediate zone can have characteristics of uh, both nucleate and flame boiling. This particular point corresponds to the maxima 
in the the maximum heat flux corresponding to a nucleate boiling regime and it is hence called a critical heat flux. If we are dealing with uh, water and atmospheric condition, this pure convective zone uh, runs up to 5 to 6 degrees of this delta T, whereas this critical heat flux typically appears around, uh, around a degree of superheat of 30 degree Celsius. And the corresponding heat flux value corresponding to critical heat flux can also be high, it is invariably greater than 1 megawatt or 10 to the power 6 watt per meter square because this is heat flux that we are talking about. But this applies to pool boiling and the situation that we are having here that is not pool boiling rather that is flow boiling situation as the liquid is flowing as it is entering the channel. So, in that kind of situation this is again a classical diagram here a liquid is flowing upwards through a heated channel. So, it enters as a single phase liquid here and uh, continues to remain a single phase liquid till location somewhere here where we can see small bubble that may generally gets formed at the surface and as we keeps on moving upwards those uh, bubbles keep on increasing in size and then they starts getting separated from the walls. As we move further the smaller bubbles uh, generally agglomerate together to form bigger bubbles and in case of bigger bubbles we get the slug flow regime uh, and the corresponding bubbles are called slug bubbles or Taylor bubbles. These uh, bubbles are generally of a bullet shaped that is round, having a rounded head and quite flat on the rear side. As we move further down this bubble flow gives way to the annular flow regime. In the annular flow regime we have uh, liquid restricted only to the wall and the vapor occupying most of the center part of this uh, of this heated channel and this way it keeps on growing. In practical reactors we generally do not go up to the annular flow regime or uh, may reach quite close to that, but uh, we generally do not want to go even beyond where the entire liquid gets converted to vapor and we are dealing with something like a single phase vapor zone. Corresponding uh, heat transfer uh, variation or the wall and fluid temperature variations are shown alongside where the surface temperature that uh, keeps on increasing till some point here or I should say the surface temperature initially increases and once the um, small bubble starts to appear somewhere here the surface tension the corresponding wall and fluid temperature variation is shown here. Initially both the temperature keeps on increasing almost in proportion till small bubble starts to appear uh, somewhere here the small bubble starts to appear. Um, but interestingly in this zone the fluid temperature is yet to reach the saturation and that is why they are often called the subcooled boiling zone. Subcooled boiling is, is a situation where the walls are at a temperature higher than the saturation and that is why small bubbles may start appearing at the walls. But uh, as soon as those bubbles get separated from the walls they come in contact with highly subcooled liquid and therefore they gets condensed. As the temperature of the uh, bulk fluid keeps on increasing and is about to reach the saturation, then some of the subcooled bubbles may survive in the bulk of the liquid as well. But once the bulk of the liquid reaches saturation, then we call that saturated boiling. So, once we enter the saturated boiling zone, then the wall temperature remains constant and the fluid temperature also remains constant at the saturation temperature this entire portion is called the nucleate boiling zone, which is analogous to this nucleate boiling regime of pool boiling. But this saturated uh, nucleate boiling continues till the appearance of the annular flow regime where we have the force convective transfer and finally, the liquid deficient zone where the flame on the wall that completely evaporates. And when at this particular juncture when the liquid flame at the wall completely evaporates then um, the uh, heat that is supplied to the wall it has nowhere to go basically because there is no liquid flame in contact with the wall. There are only uh, vapor which is having a very poor conductivity and maybe some small liquid droplets which uh, you can find here in these uh, which are uh, just floating around in the vapor and they are not likely to come in contact with the wall. And therefore, there is a sudden uh, decrease in the communication between the heat transfer communication between the wall and the fluid which is referred as the dry out. So, in the dry out zone you can uh, clearly see that the temperature of the wall suddenly jumps to a very high value 
and this difference can be quite significant fluid temperature continues to be the saturation temperature till all this liquid droplets completely evaporates and then once it reaches a perfect vapor situation then only it starts to increase. This entire uh, topic of boiling uh, heat transfer or uh, this flow and uh, pool boiling is uh, extremely complicated and requires uh, I, I should say several lectures for this, but uh, as our purpose is only to get an idea about the nuclear thermal hydraulics. So, just to know the names of all these regimes is sufficient. So, you can see that in a typical uh, uh, coolant flow through a channel in something like in a boiling uh, water reactor, we get different regimes like initially a single phase liquid regime, then a subcooled boiling regime, then saturated nuclear boiling regime, a forced convective heat transfer regime and finally, liquid deficient regime going to the convective heat transfer to single phase vapor. And in terms of the flow, flow regimes that is the visual nature of the flow regimes, we may have a bubbly flow, then we may have a slug flow and giving to annular flow and finally, a drop flow regime where we are only having liquid drops uh, floating in vapor phase. If we look further into the subcooled boiling part, uh, till some point which is called O and B that is onset of nuclear boiling it is only single phase vapor something like this. Here the flow is considered from uh, somewhere downstream location in the upward direction, but O and B to something called F D B the fully developed boiling there are only very minor almost um, microscopic level uh, vapor bubbles can be identified on the walls. As we reach this fully developed boiling zone, the temperature difference between wall and saturation temperature uh, difference between the saturation temperature and the bulk fluid temperature is much smaller. So, much bigger bubbles can be seen on the walls, but still there are no vapor bubbles in the bulk of the fluid because in the bulk in the close to the center line the temperature is uh, way below the saturation. Then we reach something called OSV onset of significant void. This is the location from where the bubbles can actually get uh, can actually survive even after getting detached from the wall because here the degree of subcooling for the liquid is quite small and uh, very soon uh, uh, the entire fluid reaches the saturation temperature. So, the mechanism of uh, subcooled boiling is uh, quite very much different compared to what we have in case of saturated boiling. In case of saturated boiling the entire fluid is already at the saturation temperature and so whatever heat that is supplied that entirely is spent to uh, uh, entirely spent to vaporize the fluid that is entire heat contributes as latent heat. However, in the subcooled boiling zone a part is utilized as latent heat to produce vapor on the walls, but a major part is utilized in heating the single phase liquid and accordingly we need to use different kind of heat transfer correlations for subcooled boiling zone and the saturated boiling zone. For subcooled boiling zone the Jens and Lotus correlation is preferred which is having a form like this. Here this G is the uh, mass flask which is basically the mass flow rate divided by cross section area of the channel mass flow rate of the coolant by the cross section area and delta T sub is the degree of subcooling at that particular location delta T sub as I have mentioned it is just saturation temperature minus bulk fluid temperature. M uh, and H is the heat transfer coefficient M and C are two coefficients which depends on the local pressure and uh, these are some representative values. Once we read the uh, saturated boiling zone particularly in uh, smooth circular tubes this is one relation that can be used. You can see it is uh, a quite complicated form actually. There are several such correlations exist because this is an active area of experimental research and uh, it has been found that this uh, heat transfer correlations can depend on infinite number of factors when two phase flow is involved. This is just a uh, representative one to give you a, an idea how complicated it can be. You can see uh, on the left hand side we have H upon H single phase here HSP refers to the single phase heat transfer coefficient means instead of being a two phase mixture if the entire fluid is flowing as a single phase liquid then what would have been the corresponding heat transfer coefficient and this HSP is can be calculated using something like detached voltage relation or maybe the one that I have referred earlier. On the right hand side first we have the density ratio here rho f is the saturated liquid density and rho g is the saturated vapor density. FR is the fluid number 
a fruit number is not a non dimensional number which presents the ratio of inertial and gravitational forces and fruit number typically is defined as root over u square by g into l where u is the velocity of the fluid g is the gravitational force and l is some suitable length scale like uh, if we are talking about uh, flow through a smooth circular tube then l can be the diameter of the tube so it it is u by root over g into d in that kind of situation and this uh, function f function of fluid number this actually depends on the exact orientation of the flow that is we are having an upward flow or downward flow uh, maybe some idea about the surface roughness etc then we have uh, this is a heat flux that is applied to the wall hf d is the latent heat of vaporization and g is the mass flux which i have just mentioned and finally there is another gs which is actually a coefficient which depends on the combination of the metal that is used in the surface and the fluid itself and x bar is the mean vapor mass fraction which is defined like this is the area averaged mean for mass fraction because in a single uh, cross section there may be significant difference in the mass fraction value like if we take uh, a sample somewhere here at at this particular cross section uh, at here you will be getting some value of the vapor cross section vapor void fraction or mass fraction here also you will be getting something but if you take a sample from somewhere you are going to get a mass fraction of zero so we need to define an average mass fraction and this x bar value can be put here this relation is applicable for x bar a wide range of x bar from 0 to 0.8 so, the choice of heat transfer coefficient is a complicated topic in uh, not only in nuclear thermal hydraulics, but any heat transfer applications as we are depending on experimental heat transfer correlations. So, before picking one we should be very very careful whether that is at all applicable for our case or not. Like in this the last one that I have mentioned it is applicable over a wide range of x bar that is 0 to 0 0.8, but say the situation you are dealing with that is having a very high vapor mass fraction somewhere close to the channel outlet of your channel which is something like 0 0.9 then this is not at all applicable we have to found something suitable. So, this takes us to the end of this particular module here we have learned about homogeneous and heterogeneous reactors we have seen that homogeneous nuclear reactors are primarily used for uh, small scale applications medical um, isotope production or hydrogen production kind of research but heterogeneous reactors are primarily used in uh, uh, power generation where we have fuel and moderator placed in a repeated pattern of discrete bodies. Uh, we have discussed about the desirable properties of fuel and uh, cladding material, uh, large thermal conductivity and high melting point is preferred for a fuel. Cladding provides a structural support to the fuel and all can also aid heat transfer particularly in gas cooled reactors. Then we have discussed about the energy that can get transferred or that is physically uh, practically available uh, for uh, transfer to the coolant and that is generally 75 to 80 percent of the total that is released during fission. Thermal resistance of fuel cladding and coolant flame must be considered during thermal appraisal and can be some further resistances like if there is any gap between fuel and cladding surfaces some further resistances may come into picture. Both neutron flux and power generation strongly varies along the height of a reactor. So, during the analysis we need to uh, take that into consideration. While bulk fluid temperature continuously increases during such an analysis we have found that temperature at the cladding surface and fuel center line both show a maximum. And uh, we have derived mathematical ways of uh, estimating the corresponding location and also the value of concerned temperature. And finally, we have uh, discussed a lot about heat transfer coefficients both single phase and two phase versions and we have concluded that proper care must be exercised while selecting the correlation for heat transfer coefficient. So, uh, this is where I would like to uh, finish the fifth module where I discussed about thermal hydraulics. There are quite a few small problems that you can solve on this please follow all the mathematical parts that whatever derivations that I have done here try to do all those derivations on your own and then check back with the slides whether the, they are correct or not. And uh, in the assignments mathematical problems will be there please try to solve them if you find any issue do not hesitate to communicate to us we are ready to reply to you. Thanks a lot.